So my name's Aaron Newcomb. I am the director of App Dynamics Cloud Strategy, according to the slide. Uh, so that means that I talk about our cloud solutions with uh, customers and internally uh, try to promote them. And so that's what we're here today to talk about. And I've got two great customers, which I'll introduce in a minute. Um, they're going to come up and talk about how they've implemented uh, their solution with App Dynamics as well. But let's go ahead and kick this off. A little bit about me. I've had a varied uh, background, varied history, different companies I've worked for, mostly in the enterprise space. Um, and then I also do some stuff on the side. I, I've written a little book. I like to do uh, maker activities. So if you've seen the Game of Thrones downstairs in the expo hall, that's mine. Uh, it was a lot of fun to build. Um, and I built it at Venetian Makerspace, which is a local nonprofit that I started about five years ago. So um, those, a little bit about me and my background. This is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about uh, basically what's going on in the cloud and why things aren't working necessarily as expected. Um, in a lot of some cases they do, but in most cases they don't quite work out the way you expect when you first start getting into cloud. Um, and then we're going to have uh, Steve come up and talk about what they're doing at GE Digital. And then we'll slip back in and talk about some of the solutions that we offer at AppDynamics before Marius comes up and talks about what they're doing at Mitchell. So it should be a really interesting session. So why do people run applications in the cloud? Usually at this point, I like to ask people, uh, why not just run them on-prem? Uh, does anybody want to throw out a, a suggestion about why people are running applications in the cloud? Yes, sir. Costs. Costs. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> Any other uh, answers? Cost, scale, right? You want to be able to scale up and down quickly, uh, react to changing environments or changing needs of your, of your company. It's the, way of the future. it's the way of the future. Yeah. Actually, it's really interesting. A lot of people um, have that reaction. And it, a lot of times that comes top down, right? So some, you get a new CTO or something, they come in and they say, hey, guess what? My last company, we moved all our applications to the cloud. So now I'm here. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to move all our applications to the cloud. And we're going to have a better brand reputation, perhaps, in the industry because we're running all of our stuff in, in the cloud somewhere. Those are all really good reasons that come up a lot when we talk about running applications in the cloud. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why there's a picture of Bob Ross. Anybody remember Bob Ross, right, the painter? Yeah, yeah. He's one of my favorite characters just because he's, like, so relaxing. I can, I can watch him do his paintings and like just chill out for a little bit. Um, but actually, uh, the reason I put Bob Ross up here was because as a kid, I was fascinated by his ability you know, in a 30-minute TV show to start with a blank canvas and come in and start painting. And by the end of it, he ended up with this beautiful picture that there's no way I could ever do myself, even though he made it look so easy, right? And people will go to the classes. They still have classes, and he still has paint supplies and all that stuff, even though he's passed away. But people will go do that because it just looks so easy, and they think it's going to be so easy to do those pictures. Um, and a lot of time, that's the way we think about cloud, when we start moving applications to the cloud, right? We're going to save money. It's going to be easier to scale. Uh, we're going to have a great brand reputation, or we're going to feel like we're really uh, getting into the 21st century and all of that. Um, unfortunately, what happens most of the time, it actually ends up looking a little bit more like this, right? So we start moving our applications to the cloud. And what happens is it looks like a, uh, someone dumped a big box of puzzle pieces on the table without the box cover. You know, there's no way we can figure out what this is. We just have to like get, dig in there and try to sort these things out. And by the way, it's not a 500-piece puzzle. This is actually a 1,000, 2,000, maybe 5,000, 10,000 piece puzzle that we have to deal with because all the pieces are becoming smaller in the cloud. So now we have things like serverless and containers to deal with. And making sense of that world becomes a lot more complicated than we first thought it was going to be. This is something we like to talk a lot about at Cisco and AppDynamics. It's something we call the central nervous system. Now, the central nervous system, really the main goals here are to create visibility and give you insight into what's going on in, in your uh, application and infrastructure, and at the end of the day, provide an opportunity to take an action based on that. So you're making intelligent actions at the end of the day. Um, it's something that I'm going to be referencing through the uh, presentation. Um, but the main things I wanted to point out is the fact that what AppDynamics does, or what we're trying to do, is bring visibility into this complex space and then provide correlation uh, with all the different metrics and events we're collecting so that at the end of the day, you can take action and hopefully make the process a lot easier for you and your company. So let's talk about why things aren't working out. So this is a recent survey from RightScale. Uh, just came out a few months ago, actually. And the numbers in terms of cloud adoption are going up. So compared to a few years ago, the respondents said that there was about 85%, maybe 90% of people 
were actually adopting cloud had some sort of workload that they knew about that was running in the cloud, right? A lot of people have workloads running in the cloud that they don't know about. Um, but according to the respondents, about 7,000 of them said, uh, you know, 94% of that 7,000 said that um, they're running applications in the cloud, either private cloud, public cloud, and so forth. When they were asked what their number one concern was uh, with running in the cloud, the number one concern came back cost. So that's why I said that was a great answer before. Um, and then they were asked, well, how much of that do you think is being wasted? How much of that infrastructure, application deployment, how much of that is being wasted? And what they came back with was 27%. Although, even in the study, if you go to this study, Flexera said that the customers that they talk to when they're um, alone with them, you know, and they're not in a group and all that kind of stuff, and they, they, they're more willing to tell the truth, it's probably more like 35%. So over a third of the infrastructure and supporting technology that's deployed in the cloud, um, according to the people that deploy it, is, is wasted. That means there's maybe some uh, uh, servers that aren't actually needed. You know, things, are, things are getting spun up when they don't need to, or they're not getting uh, torn down quick enough if, in terms of uh, container deployments. If we break down those numbers a little bit more, if we just look at those companies that consider themselves enterprise, right, those companies that have 1,000 plus employees, you can see that almost none of them, actually only 3% of them, have no plans for cloud, right? A very small percentage. Um, and most of the companies that were surveyed say they have a multi-cloud strategy. So it's not just, oh yeah, we're running things in the data center and we're running things on, pick your service provider of choice, AWS, for example, right? It's not just, yeah, on-prem and AWS, that's our strategy. It's everywhere, right? And, and a lot of them have uh, uh, some sort of hybrid cloud strategy, which means that they're going to have some uh, workloads running on-prem for a while, but they're also going to have some in at least private cloud or public cloud or multitude of clouds. So it's no longer a simple world where we're just kind of getting started and moving our workloads in the cloud. It's actually we're, we're moving our workloads and dispersing them across multiple cloud platforms. And that happens organically a lot of times when companies acquire another company. So if you're running an AWS and you acquire a company that's a .NET shop, you know, a lot of times they'll be running in Azure. So just organically you end up having a multi-cloud um, um, initiative even though you might not have planned for it. So this is a quote by Gardner. Um, this is a report and actually I'll show you at the end where you can get this report. Um, I'll give you a link if you wanna go download it. Uh, but they estimated that fewer than 15% of organizations are actually implementing holistic monitoring in the cloud. And what that means is a platform that provides you broad visibility across all your applications and infrastructure so that you can really dive in and see what's going on and resolve problems quickly. And they estimate that that puts $255 billion of investments at risk for cloud-based solutions. So that's a huge amount of money on the table um, really just because they didn't implement monitoring in a way that lets them effectively take a look at what's going on in their environment. So just to illustrate that a little bit, I mean, this is my world back in uh, 2000 or whenever it was that I started uh, doing my data center work as a customer. Um, things were a lot simpler back then, right? We had the network, application, running on a server, maybe a database out there, a few endpoints, and maybe that was multiplied you know, 10 or 20 times because we have multiple environments and multiple applications to run. Um, but what happens is people start moving to the cloud, they end up having more dependencies. Um, and what that means is that they start adopting things like um, uh, third-party services, right, or SaaS services um, that they want to take advantage of. And all of a sudden, their architecture starts to spread out, not just beyond the data center, but beyond the, the walls of their uh, domain. And then as we broaden out even more, you can see that when we start talking about uh, multi-cloud, things become even more dynamic. So when we start thinking about things like container deployments or serverless deployments now, microservices that may be running all over the place, um, the ability to, to track and, and maintain and monitor all of these different platforms becomes very, very challenging. In addition to that, there's faster development cycles. So we used to push code out maybe once a year, you know, in the case of uh, AOL, anybody remember AOL? You know, you get a disk in the mail every three months, right, that you use as a coaster in my case, because um, they would come so frequently. But now people are pushing out code every hour, right? There's people that are pushing out tens and thousands of updates, of code updates, every single day. And so dealing with that complexity becomes very complicated. Not only is dealing with the, the sprawl, if you will, very complicated, but also dealing with the monitoring complexity becomes very difficult as well. 
So if you think about it, in the data center, at least when I worked in the data center, we had specific tools that we like to use to monitor our environment, right? And then when you start thinking about multi-cloud, all of a sudden you're bringing in new vendors that have their own monitoring capabilities. Um, your applications are starting to, to stretch out beyond your data center. And then when you start talking about multi-cloud, things get even more complex, right? Um, and then those applications start to have dependencies on each other. And the classic example I, I like to use is, let's say you have an application that's running in AWS, um, but you have a relational database with all your customer information that for legal reasons has to be kept on-prem. And so now you're making calls back to that relational database from the cloud, um, hopefully in a secure way, um, but that's happening um, um, throughout the day as you bring in new customers to your platform or customers look up their account information. Um, so now you have traffic flowing between clouds and between on-prem and cloud. And each of these cloud solutions has their own monitoring capability, right? Which is great. Amazon has CloudWatch and X-Ray. Um, Azure has Insights. Um, Google Cloud has Stacktrace. And these are all great tools in and of themselves. The problem is they don't talk to each other. Um, so you need some sort of tool overriding all of this that will actually give you a consistent view of your world. So just digging into that a little bit more, talking about the difference between cloud monitoring tools and AppD, they both collect metrics and events. They both provide some sort of visual representation of what's going on in your architecture. Um, but then after that, there's some things that don't necessarily happen with all of those tools. So being able to operate across multiple platforms, we just talked about, that's really important. Being able to correlate, correlate the metrics and event, events that they're collecting back to either end user or business transactions that are happening in your, your infrastructure, no, most of them do not go to that level, right? And that can be really key when you're trying to determine how the problem you're having is affecting a particular subset of customers, for example, or is affecting your ability to convert customers uh, um, or people into new customers, right? They also don't typically automatically baseline everything for you, right? And a baseline is super important when you're talking about an environment as complex as this. Uh, you should have a platform that can do that automatically for you that will be able to take some sort of action when you deviate from that baseline. So I'm gonna pause here just for a second and I'm gonna ask Steve to come up and talk about what they're doing at DE Digital to combat some of this complexity. Steve? Thanks, Aaron. Um, can I kill your clicker? Thanks. Um, so, what do I have here? So I am the Senior Director of Predicts Telemetry and Performance um, and I'm in a branch of GE called GE Digital. Uh, let's go through a couple of things. So when you think about GE, some folks think refrigerators, light bulbs, and that kind of stuff, and consumer electronics. Um, but we're also in every industrial space. Uh, we've got seven different verticals. Um, so a couple of things that folks don't necessarily think about. Um, so every two seconds, there's a commercial aircraft with a GE aviation engine that takes off. Um, there are about 2,000 2, flights in the air at any given time. So that's a medium-sized city in the air all the time. Um, GE power assets generate about half the world's total installed power base. This is between hydro, nuclear, um, mixed cycle, natural gas, and others. 80% uh, of the power moved throughout North America is controlled by GE systems. So this is um, GE power grids and other transmission line technologies. And we're the number one manufacturer of wind turbines in the United States. Um, our biggest wind turbines right now are 12 megawatts, um, and they're, they're a little bit taller than Eiffel Tower. And for reference, 12 megawatts is about what Frankfurt pulls in a day. So one turbine for Frankfurt. Um, so we do our own asset performance management, so as if APM wasn't overloaded enough. Um, we do our own for um, industrial assets, manufacturing execution systems for things like Procter & Gamble, um, Fosters actually has their own execution system for processing chickens, uh, for like something way out. Um, we also built an on-prem private cloud platform. We've discovered as we've convinced our industrial customers that public cloud is safe, yay, and then they realize they need connectivity back to an on-prem enterprise system. Um, so we've had to slice some part of our cloud operations, come up with some mechanism of packaging it and putting it on-prem. Um, so yeah, we've got sort of a unique set of challenges where we need to be able to monitor and holistically cover 
um, control systems to what's on the edge on-prem to cloud services, as well as from the, the UI folks use in their phones or tablets, um, all the way down to the underlying infrastructure. Um, mission critical applications. So these are things like cities, hospitals, power grids, airplanes, stuff that really can't fail, because then you're talking about really affecting human lives. Uh, it's a little different when I was in consumer electronics working on these kind of things. Um, if Siri has a bad day, you're like, eh. uh, hospital goes down, you're like, oh my god. Um, and yeah, we've had a number of uh, changing priorities over the last few years. Um, originally it was, let's make the stuff that's on-prem really, really amazing. And they're like, well, we ran out of space, let's go to Colo because physical assets we can touch are what I really trust. And then you run out of space and then you have to go into something you can dynamically expand and contract in public cloud. Um, and then single to multi-cloud, um, as Aaron was mentioning, AWS is usually somebody's first choice because an engineer or a senior manager knows like, I've done this in the past, it's really good, I trust it. Um, other folks through acquisitions we've made are in Azure first, um, usually because of O365 or some other BI stuff that's there. Um, and our, again, our private cloud stuff really came up for industrial customers that want to do things with cloud services, but they can't like nuclear power plants. So it's stuff that's fully disconnected, not attached to anything other than their own industrial systems. Uh, so cloud migration, the, the biggest challenge we've had with that is um, consistency of tools. Um, since we have seven different verticals, they each have their own BUs, and we're trying to do a holistic telemetry solution for all of them. Um, tool sprawl is prevalent, and as much as I like to do uh, telemetry and performance analytics for cloud solutions, I'm not gonna do it with 50 tools. I'm not gonna do it with five tools. I'm gonna get it down to like two, maybe three. Um, application is really, application tracing is really hard because as soon as you go from uh, enterprise cloud to multi-cloud, as Aaron was highlighting, like how do you do transaction tracing from uh, a web UI to one cloud to maybe BI that's in another cloud and tie everything together um, another problem is between uh, analytics for virtual machines versus EC2 instances versus Azure SKUs. Um, it's not always gonna be consistent, and the metrics you have for each cloud provider are different, and what you're using for VM technologies or containerization is all different. So you need some way to normalize and gather a baseline. Uh, if you've got a great um, AI team, they can figure it out. I don't have a huge business analytics team, so being able to get a baseline automatically from the tools we're already using is super, super helpful. Um, Multi-cloud. Uh, I put a thing in the notes. So everybody has a plan for multi-cloud. Not that many people are doing multi-cloud in production, like really, really. They have discrete solutions that are deployed in AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. They're usually at different levels of maturity and they're very rarely connected together in like in real production. There are, there are folks that do it, I'm like, I totally cheer them on, but for my teams, especially for industrial, it's really, really hard. So, um, the biggest thing for us is to really drop the mean time to detection. Uh, as I said, for industrial type applications, the stuff really can't go down. Uh, when we say we're gonna have cloud service uptime for three nines or three and a half nines, we really have to have the data behind it, and the only way to do that is to really invest in something like AppDynamics to really gain like top to bottom, like north, south, or east, west um, detectivity. Detection, detectivity, I made that up right now. Um, so one of the uh, fringe benefits of this, if you wanna put it that way, is getting new levels of insights. So once you have things uh, instrumented reasonably well, uh, we've been able to locate hotspots in our Kafka systems, in uh, a number of things in Pivotal Cloud Foundry, um, other application connectivity that we didn't know existed, and a lot of our software engineers didn't know existed until we're seeing uh, 
latency in the end user application, we are able to follow down 13 elements deeper into the stack, and we're like, guys, come on. Um, it also helped to refine our telemetry approach. Um, as I said, we had massive tool sprawl. Every team has their own favorite. Um, and part of our digital transformation strategy for all of our seven different BUs was to pull everybody together and try and standardize and adopt a single set of solutions. Um, it's helped me to maintain a really small team, and it's made the barrier to entry for a lot of teams much more palatable, so they're willing to, willing to come and play. So, making them available isn't enough. Um, we set the bar, like for my team specifically, because I wanted to maintain a small team, we set the, like, the you must be this tall to ride like as low as possible, um, but you know, just making that available isn't enough. Uh, we did office hours, we did a bunch of code steps in GitHub, um, made our uh, adoption strategy feel very familiar to engineers. So um, that was super good. And it really took getting uh, backing from all of our C-suite to really make this happen. Because me as a senior director, like running around beating people about the head and shoulders, like, yes, you have to do this, uh, wasn't good enough to get my VP and SVP on board, still really wasn't good enough because there wasn't anybody that wielded a big enough hammer to like, really force people to adopt. Um, once I got up to our C-suite and showed them, like, yes, uh, here's how this reflects in our uh, true cost to serve, here's how we're showing like, you can recognize wasted effort, um, then it starts to get into our DNA, and then a top-down approach um, becomes possible, or made it possible for my team to really go and do that. So things that are on deck for us, APM. So again, we're gonna overload that a little bit. So we have our own asset performance management tools, then in terms of application performance management, uh, there are pockets of folks that do this really well. Um, in general, people talk about it, they have a plan, they never really get there. Um, synthetics are something that uh, teams that were familiar with New Relic did really well. Um, not everybody is familiar with New Relic and not everybody had access to engineers that could really go and do New Relic well. Um, as software developers and other engineers, cloud engineers, um, APM, or yeah, APM and synthetics through App Dynamics has been a lot easier. Um, integration with our other tools like ServiceNow, Splunk, um, some of our other BI tools and business analytics has make it, made it a lot easier. Um, the APIs that are available for App Dynamics make it a lot easier. And then now that we've been able to share some of our successes with our own GE for GE businesses and some of our other customers like Baker Hughes, Shell, BP, Chevron, um, they're like, I, I need me some of that. How do I get some of that? It's like, well, sh you need to talk to. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody wants some when it works well. So we'll go back to Aaron. Thank you very much, Steve. That's great. It's always interesting when uh, we didn't plan this, but a customer comes up and everything they talk about is exactly what we were just saying. Um, so it was a great example of how you're dealing with all that complexity, as we said before. I did want to take a minute just to walk through some of the, the tools and the things that we offer from AppDynamics to give you an idea of some of the visibility that we provide into the environments like Steve's. Um, so I'm going to do this quickly. Um, but in terms of the visibility we provide, uh, we provide uh, a view much like this. In fact, if you go down to our demos that we're doing down on the expo floor, you'll actually see uh, a version of our flow map. And uh, actually, Marius has a version in his slides as well, we get to in a minute. But basically, what we want to be able to do is provide that cross-platform, uh, cross-cloud uh, architecture view of the world that you need to make sense of how your applications are talking to other dependencies, right? And not only that, we want to collect all the events and metrics and be able to, to baseline those um, to give you an idea of how your, your particular transactions are 
performing compared to the way that they performed um, uh, last week or last month or last year, for example. And we use that to be able to uh, uh, set off an alert, for example, if, let's say, CPU utilization spikes above what it should be comparatively. Um, we'll actually trigger an alert, we'll take a snapshot, a detailed snapshot of what's going on in the environment, so that when you come in to take a look at those problems, number one, we're solving for that mean time to detection that we talked about actually before, and we're also helping you resolve that problem faster by having those baselines in place. The other thing that we've introduced recently is anomaly detection, um, which provides root cause um, uh, uh, analysis for particular problems that, that might pop up. And we're really trying to drive down that time that it takes to diagnose a particular problem. Uh, we released a feature last January called the Cognition Engine, and really it will monitor all of those baselines, events, and metrics that we just talked about, and it will correlate them with machine learning to drill down onto a particular problem for you so that you don't have to do it by yourself. So that when you open up our tool, whether it be on a browser, in your mobile device, you'll actually see, hey, we detected an anomaly, and here's where it is. We think it's thread contention, or we think it's a problem with this particular application service that's causing your transaction to your customer to slow down. So we do that for you now automatically, as opposed to having you take a few clicks to try to dig into that information. We offer, also offer visibility for some of the modern deployment methodologies that people are using these days, like Kubernetes and containers. So we have deep uh, um, ability to, to drive deep down into the metadata for Kubernetes specifically and your container environments. Because they are ephemeral workloads, it's really helpful to have those snapshots I mentioned before so that if your environment has uh, gone away, right, if you're coming into a particular problem after the fact and those containers are already gone, you can still go back and look at the data and see what was going on at a particular point in time um, and drive and figure out how to fix that particular problem so that the next time you deploy additional containers into your environment, you have that situation resolved. Um, and so we provide that as well. And then another thing that people use our tools for is release validation. So a lot of folks are moving towards a DevOps environments where they're releasing codes much more frequently than they used to. And it's very helpful to have a tool like this, for example, if you're doing a Canary release, to be able to track those two releases side by side and figure out if the new release is performing better than the existing release. And then that gives you a, a, a way to determine whether you should push that release out to the rest of your customer base. So here you can see we're doing that and we're actually tying that information back to uh, Kubernetes and a particular set of pods that relate to our Canary release, and we're comparing that to the rest of our environment that is our stable release. And, you, and in this case, the Canary release is, uh, has a better response time in this case than the existing release. So in this case, you might decide, yeah, let's go ahead and push that out to the rest of our customer base or, or end users. Uh, we also introduced recently monitoring for Java applications in Lambda. So if you're uh, in a company who's considering using the serverless, uh, we now provide support for Java on Lambda, and we're working on more and more serverless support as well as we move forward. Um, but the main takeaway here is that, again, you're going to monitor these environments the same way that you would monitor all of your other environments. It doesn't look any different. We provide you with the same uh, capabilities in terms of raising alerts and looking and, and developing baselines and looking at transactions that it would if it lived on native infrastructure. For those things that we don't offer like an out of the box or in platform solution for, we also offer integrations. So we have a lot of integrations for all the cloud providers as well as deployment methodologies that a particular company might have. In this case, we're looking at our EC2 integration for AWS. And what's interesting in this integration is you can clearly see from the default dashboard how many idle EC2 instances you have by region, for example. And of course, you can go in and tweak all these. But again, getting back to that cost and scale uh, reasons that people have for moving to cloud, this is something that I would probably want to have on a dashboard in my office somewhere so that I know, hey, well, for some reason we have a lot of idle res resources in a particular region or whatever. Um, you can take a look at that information and then you can drill down from there to see what's going on and why there's, you have those wasted resources. Um, and then you can go in and correct it, correct the problem, change your deployment methodology, whatever you need to do uh, to be more proactive when it comes to scaling up and down your environment. Now let's talk a little bit about a few of the use cases or insights. So we've talked about the visibility and all the things we monitor and all those events and metrics we're pulling into our platform, but what does it mean for, for you all? 
Uh, you may have seen this before if you're an AWS customer. They talk about migration, cloud migration, in terms of six R's, and you can see them there, rehost, replatform, repurchase. The ways that people move uh, to the cloud, a lot of people think first, well, I'm just gonna lift and shift, right? I'm gonna pick up my application, put it on an instance in AWS, I'm not really gonna change anything. But a lot of times that's not sufficient, and so people have to replatform or refactor their applications. Maybe they're taking advantage of new technologies. Maybe they were running on VMs in the data center. Now they're running on containers in the cloud. Um, and the nice thing is, is that AppDynamics can actually help with any of these and all of these. Um, so no matter how you're moving applications into the cloud, we can actually provide value for you when, when you do that. And the way that we do that is that we can validate how, those, uh, how that migration happens. So we can set a baseline before you move your applications uh, to see, okay, here's how your application is performing, here's how the infrastructure is performing, and then after and during the migration as you move over, we can keep doing those baselines so then you can come back to the company later on and maybe provide them with some of this information. We're actually converting more customers after we moved our application to the cloud. The application is performing faster, we have a lower response time, et cetera, et cetera. So you can come back and make that case that hey, we took the time and the money to move over to the cloud, and guess what? It's paying off. Coming back to cost again, some of our uh, built-in capabilities and integrations with the various cloud providers uh, uh, in some of their tools like CloudWatch, we can actually pull back a lot of the uh, spending information uh, for what people are spending for various cloud environments. And the nice thing about using AppDynamics and taking a look at this data in AppDynamics is then you can correlate the spend that you have with various services uh, or for various application environments to the revenue that they are generating or the end user experience that they are delivering for your customers. So you're correlating the information. It's not just about did we hit our budget or did we go over budget this month. It's yeah, we went over budget, but you know we had 30% increase in the amount of users that we were able to bring onto our platform, right? So it's probably justified in that case. I wanted to give you a little bit of example about how this all plays together. We talked about the visibility that we have into cloud environments. We talked about some use cases that you might use. Um, but what, what actually happens when there's a problem and what does App, App Dynamics um, provide? So this is just an example of coming back to that analogy of visibility insights in action. Perhaps App Dynamics detects an anomaly in your environment, high CPU utilization and so forth. Um, we would detect that and then we may correlate that information with some information that we're pulling out of your applications that are running in AWS in this example. Or we may be able to correlate that with some information that we're bringing in from CloudWatch or X-Ray. And based on that, we can detect root cause and then you can take an action, right? You can open uh, an incident in ServiceNow. You, maybe you wanna create a Slack channel to bring everybody so that when they get paged, they, uh, uh, they can just click on the Slack channel and they see what the conversation has been so far. Um, and then maybe you need to use AWS CloudFormation, for example, to spin up some more containers in your environment to deal with uh, the workload or what have you, right? So these are all ways that we can do this um, in concert with the existing tools you're using uh, to provide a better experience and, and, and reduce the mean time that it takes to detect and the mean time that it takes to resolve problems when they occur. And then, of course, there's a feedback loop. So after we've resolved the problem, the tickets are closed out, we go right back to detecting, and we're always collecting those baselines um, to figure out what's going on in your, in your application infrastructure um, so that the, the cycle continues. It doesn't just stop when something, when you close out the ticket, right? All right, I wanna pause there and bring up Marius to talk about what they're doing um, at Mitchell. So Marius, come on up. I will hand you the clicker. One, two, three. Perfect. I should have gone first. I think there's no way I could beat the GE use case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, my name is Maris Renian. I'm a director of R&D at Mitchell International. And for the last year or so, I've been really working on trying to get App Dynamics pushed throughout the organization. We've been using AppD for about three years in different BUs, but now we want to approach it holistically. and. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what we've been doing. So, uh, Mitchell International, we deal with the property and casualty industry. And what we do is we basically have software that does the uh, behind the scenes, either estimating uh, of what it would cost to fix a vehicle. On workers' comp, we basically do bill review, so we reduce the cost of medical expenses for a workers' comp bill review. 
We have about 35 products or so across uh, the P uh, PNC industry, and we're leaders in that space. And uh, we started about seven years ago. We started publishing textbooks. So these were textbooks that basically contained all the parts for a particular vehicle along with their cost. So auto body shops would use that information to estimate what it would cost to repair your vehicle. And through time, we've grown to build digital solutions and then acquired more and more uh, businesses outside of that particular industry. And now, again, we've grown to really provide services way beyond just the auto uh, side of the house. Currently, our customer portfolio includes about 30,000 uh, auto body shops, 300 uh, of the largest insurers. You, any uh, big logo you've probably heard of probably do business with us. And we have over 67,000 pharmacies within our network. We process a little over 100 million transactions, and these are end-to-end -end transactions, whether it's a bill or a claim, and uh, that accounts for about 80 billion worth of claims impact. So we touch 80 billions worth of transaction flowing through our systems every day. And we have multiple locations throughout the US and uh, now spreading throughout Europe as well. So from our perspective, you know, what, what does our environment look like? We have six data centers, two in the US, two in Canada, and two in Europe. We manage about 1,000 physical, uh, physical machines and 12,000 VMs on top of those machines. We have about 1,200 technical resources across our engineering teams and development teams. And we also run on Azure and AWS. So over the last five years, like a lot of organizations, we're starting to reach out there into the, the public cloud offerings for you know, best of breed solutions. Whether we're talking about AWS for the machine learning capabilities, Azure for some of the container capabilities, you know, we're slowly branching out and, and going beyond the on-prem and colo solutions that we have. And why we've been looking at App Dynamics really is everything we've spoken about, you know, as you're adding multiple uh, hosting locations, you know, tracing becomes more and more difficult to be able not to just trace your, your network environment and how that's running, but also your application. So one of the, the biggest issues we had is fragmented tools, not only between teams, but between business units, between providers. Uh, you know, Azure has their own tooling, AWS has their own tooling, on-prem, we had different teams with different tools. You know, using Nagios on one side, Splunk, using, uh, you know, custom Elk stack. Some teams are doing their own custom database entries. So just a lot of chaos. Um, and we had a team on our auto physical casualty side that adopted Apti about three to five years ago. And they were using it on a small subset of their applications. And we saw the, the benefit they were getting from that. The ability to quickly and easily trace where an issue arose and be able to, to resolve it much more quickly than having to jump through you know, a bunch of hoops. And so we basically took that concept and we said, can we push this out to the rest of our applications and can we solve for some of these challenges that we have with, you know, as we're starting to enter multi-cloud? The other big thing we started doing recently is moving our legacy applications to containers. So taking traditional IS applications, traditional Java applications, and containerizing them and putting them in new CI-CD pipelines, right? So our goal is to eventually refactor legacy applications using microservices architecture. However, on the way to get there, we didn't want to have to deal with traditional legacy VM deployment and container deployment. So we wanted to build new pipelines that, that could basically do both at the same time. So APTI is a crucial part of that strategy in making sure that we reduce the risk of what it means to containerize a legacy app and to ensure that we're monitoring baseline performance, we're monitoring its dependency and how it's reacting in a much more agile environment, where again, these are legacy apps built going back to the 80s, you know, some of them are ASP.NET back in 2005 era, where they were not built and architected for the type of environments we have today very dynamic environments that spin up resources, spin down resources. So by layering AppD into the mix here, we're able to monitor that and reduce the risk as we're moving these applications and refactoring them. The other thing we, we're doing is of course moving to DevOps like a lot of organizations. We're trying to become more efficient. We're trying to have you know, smarter, more efficient pipelines. So using AppD, we have the single pane of glass or single truth that anybody can turn to 
to view an uh, uh, entire application stack, right? So you could see how the application is performing in every data center. Um, you could have a common tool that ops can speak with support, that can speak to dev, to the network engineers, and we're all aligned on the same view, and we all understand the problem from the same perspective. This has enabled us to cut down the, again, mean time to resolution significantly, instead of having to jump through different tools that different users may or may not have access to. Right? It's the same tool, same story, same access. We can all jump in, share a link to the problem, uh, create you know, our war rooms in there, and resolve the issue much quicker. And the other thing is, again, go into a more dynamic environment with containers. Part of the issue there is configuration. A configuration issue between environments can cause chaos. Having AppD in there allows us to catch that early before it makes it out to production. It just makes the entire story you know, uh, a lot better and reduces the risk significantly. So here's a screenshot of what a clean environment looks like. This is you know, a lot of our legacy apps. We're slowly moving them into containers and we're also moving them, slowly refactoring them into microservices architecture. So we're decoupling um, different parts of the application and running that as its own service. So you could see here that as we're building that, AppD provides us the traceability between dependencies, between applications, between on-prem and on the cloud, and just makes the, the whole story a lot easier to kind of capture. So this is a clean view of a clean business unit where we're just starting down the journey and there's not much there in terms of refactoring that has happened. This is a different view of when that, you know, you get going and you start refactoring and breaking things out. You can see how complicated things are getting, right? So now you have multiple dependencies you have to track and AppD does an amazing job at, at giving you that visual. So when a service goes down, you know, that's kind of the core at your other services. If that goes down, you could see how that impact cascades throughout your other applications you're able to tra trace and you're able to diagnose it much, much quicker. So, you know, for us, even though we're not, uh, if we're down for an hour or two, it's not gonna affect lives, it still has a significant impact taken into account that we deal with, you know, 80 billion worth of transactions every year. So what's next uh, for us really is the adoption of AppD across all of the teams. Like Steve mentioned, it does require buy-in from the C-suite just running around through every team and begging and hoping that they adopt it doesn't work. It really takes in an all-in adoption uh, mindset. Everyone has to be in it together. We're at the point now where everybody sees the value and we've got different teams trying to jump on this. So we're t putting together different playbooks on how they could best adopt it based on their technology stacks, based on you know, their, their particular team's uh, uh, kind of cadence and everything else they're doing. And really, our goal is to move off of legacy technologies, move on to containers, move on to cloud, and really using AppD at the core of that to minimize the risk and make sure that we're doing this very pragmatically and very intelligently. We don't want downtime, nobody does, so this allows us to reduce that risk significantly, and it also allows us to benchmark, have uh, concrete benchmarks for what the benefits are of taking a legacy app, moving it over to a container platform, then moving that onto cloud, being able to show the cost reduction, uh, the MTTR reduction, and so on. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marius. It's really interesting to see some of your flow maps, which is that thing I was talking about before, where you really see all the dependencies right on one screen for, your, for an application environment, um, and what some of the benefits that you're getting out of having that visibility. So I wanted to take just a few minutes now, we're just about done, just to give you an idea of what we're working on at AppD for the future in terms of our support for cloud technologies and cloud service providers. So the first one is we're improving our container visibility support. So I mentioned we have pretty deep integration and ability to pull metrics out of container, Kubernetes and container environments today. Um, and what you'll see in the future is that we're gonna take that to the next level, providing even more metrics, uh, more capabilities and more automation around uh, when you're looking at environments that are running in containers and Kubernetes. Um, the other one is, is that we're bringing in more cloud service provider insights. So as I mentioned, we already work with a lot of cloud service provider monitoring tools like CloudWatch and so forth. We're gonna be improving our capabilities there to, to again, hopefully pull in some more insights that will lead into this uh, third bullet, which I'm most excited about, which is using our AI ops capabilities and platform to be able to diagnose even more uh, things that could go wrong um, in your architecture, so things that are related to cloud specifically, like uh, you know, my, uh, my North Star, my gold standard would be if we can 
uh, somehow automate the ability to point out when there's a cold start, for example, for a serverless environment, um, or a container that keeps restarting over and over again. If we can point that out automatically and show that that's the root cause for a problem, that would be pretty cool in my opinion. So that's what I'm pushing our developers to go work on. Uh, so just bringing it all back together, back to that analogy I started out with at first, right? So it's not as easy as it looks when people first start getting into cloud. It looks more like a box of puzzle pieces that were dumped on the table, but luckily AppDynamics can come along and help you sort those things out. We do that in a few ways. We provide visibility, or in this case, the box cover for the puzzle um, that allows you to at least see where the pieces are and how they relate to each other. And then we actually provide some insight, right, to be able to automatically sort those pieces, perhaps by color or by edges, or in your case, by that flow map that we mentioned earlier, showing you correlation between your applications, your end user, and your business. And at the end of the day, we want to help you actually solve this puzzle, this puzzle, this puzzle, I don't know what a puzzle is, uh, so that you can actually become your very own Bob Ross for your organization and, and, and be the champion of your organization that helps solve these problems quickly and effectively. Uh, so with that, I just want to point out a few resources. The Gartner report that I mentioned before, uh, where they were talking about holistic monitoring and the $255 billion of investments being at risk, it's a great read. If you want to read it, you can go to this uh, link or you can go to the QR code, search for it on our website. You should be able to find it there. Right, Sarah? Yes? Um, and also cloud monitoring documentation is, a, is another great way to get a deeper dive into what we're offering. So our cloud monitoring documentation is actually really good. I don't always point to a specific page in our documentation. I just say our documentation is great. But this page specifically goes into the types of solutions that we offer, how to implement them, what the benefits are, in a very technical way. So if you want to take that deeper dive, highly recommend going to our documentation site and taking a look at our uh, monitoring and cloud applications page. And then there's a great study also, if you didn't get enough this morning, you can go back and refer to a case study we have on our website about NASDAQ, where they were actually able to take their core uh, um, uh, business and turn it into, uh, and be able to resell that to other businesses um, along the way. It's a really great case study and there's a video that goes along with it. So those are the resources that we have. And now I'm gonna pause and just see if there's any questions in the room. You can always uh, join in. There is a WebEx Teams. If you use WebEx Teams, there's a WebEx Teams room where you can ask questions and we'll come back later after the fact and answer those. Um, but in lieu of that, since we have a few folks in the room, if anyone has a question now, for either me or our customers or anything in general, I'm happy to address that. Anybody have any customers? Or any customers? Anybody have any questions? I'll be up here afterwards as well um, in case uh, if you have questions. And you can also go to our uh, area downstairs in the expo hall. It's under the Business Insights banner. So if you see a big green banner, is it green? Big green banner that says Business Insights, or if you see the Cisco coffee bar area and it has a big CX, glowing CX symbol on it, you can always stop over there. We can give you a demo, show you exactly what this looks like um, um, in real time. If there's no questions, I will stop there. You're supposed to take an online evaluation. I guess they're giving out prizes. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much.